My name is Thomas, and as Andreas said, um, I like risk. Um, some might even say I love risk. Um, risk is what life uh, is about. Life is risking. Um, accept accepting it and living in with risk is when life starts being interesting. But risk is also managing risk, calculating risk, understanding risk, blind risk is dangerous risk, right? Um, and I guess maturing and learning is learning to deal with risk, understand risk. When are you actually taking risk? Today I got uh, four personal stories and a few observations to try to sort of show you what is risk actually and do we actually have it right? Is it really risk, what we perceive as risk, or is there a blind risk or a fundamental risk that we're uh, actually overlooking most of the time? Especially in these sort of times we live in where the friction, uh, the paradigms are shifting uh, from the industrial and sort of institutional area, era, where a lot of things were not risky, uh, but we're shifting back to models that resemble what society was 150, 200 years ago, where everyone were freelancers, everyone were independence, everyone were entrepreneurs, right? A farmer was an entrepreneur. Um, and we're shifting back to some of these. So uh, I'll give you a little from the, from the forefront of risking things and a few personal stories to that. The first uh, story I want to share with you is about sticking to things and is the most common risk that everyone actually takes every day. Every citizen of Denmark takes this risk actually most of their life. They're just blindly blind to it. Uh, the story is actually about where we are today, 23. Um, just when I'm giving this talk today, we're about six weeks away from a global launch uh, of a breakthrough product we've been working on for 18 months. We've probably been working 35 people for 18 months on it. I'm, I'm sure my CFO could calculate what the risk is in monetary value, uh, but I happily live not knowing the number. Um, um, because that's just risk, right? Everyone in the team is just at the brink of risking everything they've done before. Not that they're not going to get their salary, but they're going to risk being out there doing stuff they've never done before. At the peak of the game, at the highest level of the game can be played professionally. Uh, you know, we're starting an office in SF next week, uh, all kinds of stuff going on, right? For most people, this would seem like a very risky environment we're currently in. But for me, the risk of 23 is not what we're doing now. The risk of 23 is actually that we've been sticking to a core idea for 14 years. And the risk is that we've been working on this company for 12 years. My great co-founder Stefan and me have been working on this, the same thing for 12 years. Yes, we've not been totally uh, loyal. We have been doing a little fooling around on the sites here and there. Uh, obviously nowadays we're very serious and uh, very committed uh, in the relationship. But what the risk we've actually taken is that we've worked on the same thing for 12 years, right? We've stuck to it. And this is basically what everyone does and takes huge amount of risk on. That is, what is it we spend our time on planet Earth with? You risk staying in the same company, in the same organization, being stuck there, accepting the world you live in, living within the, the comforts of that zone, right? So we've now invested 12 years. Some might even also say we might have invested some of our best years, um, especially in sort of this high-paced environment where having kids and whatever starts uh, being a little bit challenging in terms of the lifestyles and what it really takes to play a global game where you're competing with Americans that have two weeks vacation per year and are just hungry 28-year-olds, all of them uh, doing 60, 70 hours a week, right? You need to be pretty smart to outdo them uh, if you start having kids and a lot of stuff. So the first thing I want you guys to think about is, okay, what is actually the risk you're taking every day? 
by sticking to what you're doing, right? What is the risk that a worker in the, in the government is taking by having worked 30 years in the same organization, right? And then one day, boom, out of nowhere, it's going to be moved to the countryside, right? Everything they've invested in, right? Personally, from a sort of leadership standpoint, I think it's so disrespectful that people that have given the, their best years to something are just treated like that. But you take an immense risk every day, right? Does the cab driver have the highest risk or his cousin that was working as a bank teller, right? As an uh, operator in the bank. Suddenly the bank business shifted and it was online. Oh, the person lost his job. You know, the cab driver doesn't know what he's going to earn tomorrow. But uh, hey, he's part of an ecosystem and doing something very fundamental that probably won't change before Uber and self-driving cars started appearing. <laughs> so really think about what is the blind risk we're all taking every day and how do you manage that? It's my story about sticking to it. Another risk that I find really interesting, and it's where risking and believing starts uh, interfacing on, on many profound levels, is what you believe in and what you stick to. And when you take very, very early bets on something, um, we'll start the story back in, uh, in the beginning of 95, January, February 95. Um, I was a lot yo younger back then. Um, we started a company called Mondo, uh, based on sort of the first Scandinavian incident company. We did a portal, we had a web agency with a movie magazine called Scope, actually still exists 21 years later, pretty peculiar. Um, we did a lot of stuff. We were young, we were, you know, the times were there. There were oh eight websites in Denmark when we started, right? And then we started from there. After a few months, um, I, I sort of started in, a, in my part-time because I was actually in the second year of my high school. Uh, so that, you know, I had to get my mom to sign the papers to register the company, right? Um, and I needed to take the call. Okay, do I believe in this internet thing and actually take a leave of absence from high school or do I go back, right? For most people, this would be perceived as an extreme risk. But what's interesting is when you really, really believe in something and you really, really know that it's for real, right? Nowadays, betting on the internet was not, nowadays everyone would be like, yeah, obviously, dude. But just imagine the amount back then. I mean, when you're really at the brisk of something just very early on, you're, fi you're fighting with people, right? The great old quote, first they ignore you, then they uh, laugh at you, then they fight you, you win, right? Always attributed to Gandhi, but he's never said it. Um, you know, there were the CD-ROM guys. They were like, ah, these internet punks. This internet is never going to go anywhere. You can't do movie stuff. You can't do, back then, you couldn't even do color on the backgrounds of the website, right? It was basically just text and a few JPEGs, right? No video, no nothing the internet you guys perceive today, right? It was a literal fight, right? When I was going to dinners in my family, people were saying, this internet thing is not going to go anywhere, right? You're, you're wasting your time on this internet thing, right? But when you actually had started researching and understanding what was going on, it was super clear that there was absolutely zero risk in, in not just taking that leave of absence from high school, right? Also because what was the worst thing that could happen? I could just go back to high school again, right? I would, the worst thing that could happen was that I learned something, right? So obviously I took a leave of absence, never returned. Um, ever since again, later needed to take the risk on, at some point, you know, early 20s, also realizing, you know, oh, okay, I'm not going to get any level of formal education, right? Uh, nowadays, my odds are probably higher at becoming a professor, something by uh, somebody giving a title because I can't actually even start studying because I don't have a high school diploma, uh, even if I wanted to, right? So risk is very interesting when you take it uh, very, very early on when you're fortunate to be in very interesting times where things really start changing and moving. But it's also what you believe in, right? And sometimes you can believe in weird stuff, right? What is real and what is not real. And uh, you also get, need to get your mind to believe in stuff that perhaps is not really real yet, right? The signals were very weak that this incident thing actually might actually be something profound, right? So it was also about believing, right? Sometimes then people can start believing in crazy stuff and start doing, taking crazy risks, right? This had actually ended up happening once again. In 2001, we had the sort of dot-com crisis. Basically, the internet died. Um, about 80% of the people I knew left the internet. 
of working with the internet, right? They went back to corporates. They went, if they had been doing internet marketing, they went back to doing marketing. If they've been doing internet design, they went back to design. You know, basically everyone left the internet again, right? And um, back then, and I don't even, whether I un understood the risk we took, um, there are a lot of people that sort of stuck to the internet, right? <laughs> Some might also say it was the only option we had because we were basically unemployable, right? Um, it was a global movement of people that were like fighting for the idea of what the internet was, that it was the social web. Nowadays, it's what Facebook, Instagram, everything is, sharing economies, sharing platforms. All this stuff basically originates back from 2001, 2005, where some people stuck to the internet, right? And back then, once again, it was crazy. Everyone were like, why, why don't you like, get a proper job? And you know, there were absolutely zero money back then, right? We were, we were scrambling by. But you could see that this beautiful internet thing was emerging again, right? We started understanding that Tim Berners-Lee's first, Berners first website was a reverse chrono chronological personal website, right? Ah, it wasn't about the corporate websites. It was about the individuals being on, on the net. It was reverse uh, chronolo chronological. It was a flow, right? What you guys now see as a feed on, on Twitter or Facebook, right? So, ah, we were actually we were really starting to understand this medium like unlike ever before because in the 90s we had just been in applying old models on this internet, trying to turn it into something where people would come with a brochure and you would put it on the web, right? It was actually literally what happened. We would like physical brochures shipped in and then we would type it in <laughs> and put, put up these websites, right? It sounds pretty crazy. But we stuck to the net and we fought it out, right? And then and amazing things started happening, right? And, it's, and even to this day, it's sort of this bond between the people that were there back then. And back there, it's, it's not like they were in a room. This is a tribe of tens to 100,000 people probably, right? A lot of them eventually end up, up building a, some, some very profound companies also um, back then. So. I want to give you the idea that even the stuff that seemingly is max risk taking is if you really read the deeper signals of what's going on, it's not actually that risky, right? Nowadays it's like, hey, I've got a 21 years education in understanding the world we live in and the web and building and designing and all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, so I actually I ended up in a, probably in a better spot than if I jo had taken the easy uh, road back then, right? But really look at what are the profound kind of levels of risk, the paradigm risk you're betting on, the company you're in, uh, the vision you're on, right? There are a lot of different levels of risk you can work with. Risk is also something that's very interesting because it changes over time. For example, building a company is basically sort of de-risking, but still trying to keep the risk in there. It's a very peculiar exercise. So the next story I'll give you is um, it's a story that starts in 2009 when I went on a journey together with some old friends to change how people work. Um, we built a company called Podio. Anyone heard of it? Most, uh, yeah. How many have used the product? Uh, oh. Um, so I'll start you with the idea that the biggest risk actually to begin with was to put something we've been working on for many, many, many years into this, into this team and into this setup, right? Um, some of the, the core idea that everyone could build their own apps was like something I'd been working on since 2002, right? Uh, the other guys have also been working on social software for five, six years, right? It's nowadays this crazy story that uh, I was a, in a basement and then three years later it was a huge success, right? Actually, it was probably more like 10 years, right? So the first risk we took was we poured everything we had into this collaboration of, of guys that were out to change things, right? We, the risk was also that none of us had ever done a commercial success. And for most of us, it was about time that we did it. <laughs> so there was so much kind of you know, risk-taking willingness that this is it. This is the time where we're really going to do something together, right? Then when you do that as a company, to begin with, it is just max risk, right? It's five scrubby weird guys in a basement, right? Um, I ended up hiring two CEO CEOs within four months because we were so successful at de-risking the risk that suddenly we could at, uh, start attracting people, a whole different caliber of people 
that didn't want to take the ultimate risk, right? So you're basically working to de-risk it. Eight months later, we were able to hire people that would normally never join a startup, right? A, a caliber level people. Um, so basically, it's a journey of de-risking, right? You work on building it up enough that suddenly it doesn't seem like there is risk, right? You suddenly have a, uh, are able to attract a CEO that, sh that shouldn't go down to a basement and do it, but you're able to hire a CEO, right? That CEO then has people perceiving around him that ah, if he's there, then there's zero risk here, right? There were probably still the same level of risk that was six months earlier, right? But there was momentum, there was energy, right? So over time, the perception of risk goes down, down right? But obviously the risk is inherently, it's a startup, it can fail every day, right? But once again, what is it you're ultimately risking? At this point, you're only taking the risk that you joined an interesting startup and learned something for 12 months, and then you could go back to whatever you were doing before, right? So you were not really actually risking anything, right? So you really start seeing this sort of level of risk. And then obviously also product-wise, you need to keep on risking it, right? Now, now here, many years later, who knows, one might uh, say that, you know, the, the core of the product, there was a certain time where we started not really risking it and pushing and challenging the core idea of the product and moving that and, and, uh, and moving that to the ne next level. We just add, started adding you know, more stuff to the product around it, right? So even there, you need to keep on risking it, right? Betting the whole idea of the core product. And uh, who knows, ultimately we probably were not really good at that um, because there was so much risk everywhere and we were so happy just that there was less risk, right? So how do you then in an environment uh, keep on risking, right? Uh, ultimately, we ended, ended up selling the company very early, um, also because it had gone so crazy well that we didn't really dare to take the next risk, right? And also due to however all this stuff works, there was pr probably not, no real incentives to take the risk financially. Um, and also, we'd done something very profound as a team together. We, 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 would we really want to take the risk of us be, being able to stick together for three, four more years, right? It's not easy when four or five boys are, are really going at each other to build something together, right? Um, and keeping it together was uh, even harder for the old chairman here. So think about how do you deleverage risk in your projects, right? And how does the perception of risk over change over time? But also understand that if, you're, if it's very risky, then you shouldn't even attempt at getting people involved in your project that don't want that level of risk, right? And some of it is perception and some of it is real and You'll have to manage that up in your head of what is, uh, what is being uh, perceived as, as risk and what is actual risk, right? The last story I want to I wanna end you up wa with is what happens if you really risk it a little bit too much. So um, for many years, I did a festival called Reboot. It started out in 98 as a, some young internet boys just saying, web workers unite. Um, it was max risk. We had a little web agency called Radiator. Um, we were tired of all these uh, stupid conferences that were, where marketing guys from big IT companies were talking about the net, and we were like, that's not the net we know. So we emailed six uh, of the greatest people we knew from SF and invited them. There was national strike the week we had the event. People needed to fly into Sweden, all kinds of craziness. It was max risk, totally crazy. The type of risk you only want as a very young person. Um, over, over the years, um, it changed. The format uh, sort of uh, developed over time. I produced it 11, uh, for 11 years, nine times. Um, in 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, it became sort of the social web, all the stuff we know today. Sort of suddenly all the people were in the same room, blogging was happening, suddenly you had like crazy lists, crazy amount of people. Some of these events are nowadays sort of, in hindsight, very crazy and very legendary at this point. Um, but ultimately, I couldn't keep on risking it. Every year, it was the max risk when you have a franchise like that to put it on again, right? And I was doing this like basically from midnight until 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, right? Uh, supposedly you can do that when you're 25 years old, but you can't start do it when you ha start having kids and all kinds of other craziness in your life. Every year, it was a struggle on, do I really want to take the risk once again? It was sort of an inner, would this thing come out of my body? And, you know, 
at this point in time, the risk was not selling the tickets. You know, we sold 600 tickets without uh, announcing who was going to be there or whatever, right? But the risk was that the was that the there was so much kind of anticipation. There was so much pressure on that it would be magical. It would just be like last year again. And you know, as an organizer, are you then willing to take the risk that you can really pour out everything and just hit the nerve of the time you're in, assemble the right people, the right energy? Is it just all the people that re read on the blogs that this event is great that are going to be coming, or are they really going to come to contribute and create something magical together, right? And at a certain time, every, what everyone perceived as the real risk was actually then to take the risky move to just say, this is it. This is it. I'm not going to do it any longer, right? This, this was an, a magic period of time. I'm not going to do it again, right? But the real risk was actually that I had gone down with severe stress two times during this phase of time, right? I was actually really risking stuff that was really important in your life, like your mental health and your relationships and your kids and other stuff, right? I was really risking something that was really stupid to be risking, right? So ultimately, I needed to take the risky move to then actually face the risk and, and fear of just saying, this is it, it's over, and how will people perceive that, and you can't do that, and every year in, in February and, and March, people are still deciding, is there going to be a reboot this year? No, there's not going to be a reboot this year, right? Um, so sometimes you also, you also risk it too much, right? It's magical, it was amazing. Uh, it's profound to know uh, when people send you emails that you changed their lives, right? It's, it's, uh, com it's better than anything I've done commercially in terms of feeling meaning. Um, but ultimately, it was basically killing me, right? Uh, I'm sure I probably could have done it some other way or organized in a different way in hindsight and all kinds of different stuff, but I wasn't ready for that back then. So that was a couple of uh, very personal stories about risk, because risk is personal. So let me just end up on a few quick uh, observations on uh, risk. We'll move fast on these. First up is that changes come from the edges. Changes come from the people that don't have anything, so they can risk everything, right? When you're 18 years old or 22 years old, you can risk everything. You don't have anything to lose. You don't have a career. You don't have money. You don't have anything to lose, right? Everything is just max risk take on the world, right? And that's where a very interesting thing is happening. It's a very, very different skill set than at a later age, than still keep on risking. It's a very different thing because suddenly you got a lot to lose. You basically, you can also then start being defensive and then you end up being a very boring person, right? <laughs> but as a, as a, you know, and this might not even be age. It can also just be, hey, you come from the edges. You come from outside the establishment. You come from outside whatever industry you're on, uh, you're in, and you want to take something on, you want to change it, right? So think about things, things are interesting on the edges, but actually the people on the edges are not really taking that great amount of risk because risk is their game, risk is their play, risk is their unfair advantage, that they can take more risk, they can believe in more crazy stuff. You know, they can believe in deep fundamental changes, right? Like when people were writing back to 2001, I had like Ev who did Twitter, Medium, Blogger, on stage, they Weiner, who did, who did the early blogger. People were writing op-ed pieces in Danish publications about how this would ruin society, that everyone could publish and communicate, right? Then you know you're really playing with inf interesting things because when people are reacting that strongly to, to something m new and profound, then you're there. But actually, I would challenge nowadays, perhaps you're not actually that risky because it was pretty easy just to believe in something that was very different from the status quo, right? Another observation is the designer's risk, right? And I feel this especially nowadays where there's so much design to look at out there that we're not actually really designing. We're more like implementing best practice. We're more like DJs just assembling a lot of good stuff together. And it can actually work, right? And I'm not saying that you should risk everything in a, in a design project. There are probably a lot of stuff you just want to be on, on best practice. But I think nowadays we really need to start keep on risking also just to have that little flavor of actually designing and not just assembling best practice from, a, from websites where you can see every design pattern <laughs> on a specific whatever thing, and then you just take a lot of screenshots and then you put it all together, right? And that is basically what a lot of design is today. Commercially, that's also what I'm, you know, there are a lot of times in this company where we just say, okay, this is just best practice. In this area, we're not gonna try to reinvent any, anything, right? 
but keep that little thing alive, that you are pushing something in the stuff you're doing that is actually at the edge, edge of things, that is taking risk, <coughs> that is not just implementing whatever is Facebook's design patterns, right? There are many reasons for building on established design patterns when you have a billion people being used to those design patterns. But when is it you, when, where is it in your stuff that you really push the needle just a little bit, keep on risking it, right? And I think this is actually with the evolution of design nowadays and all the design blocks, all the stuff going on. It's very important as creatives to keep just pushing it a little bit, right? At the same time, don't be a stupid person that are going to try to risk it on all element of design in your, uh, in your projects because then you're just out to try to prove that you can be original in any way and then you know, end up doing stupid stuff. But really find that one thing. Another observation is that our basically fundamental societal uh, challenge in many ways is that a lot of people are managing stuff that they perceive as having zero risk and they have no skin in the game. They get a big fat check no matter what. It doesn't really hurt them whether they take a risk or not. <coughs> they even perceive the status quo as, as being not risky. But our biggest risk nowadays is us perceiving that as, as uh, not having every, any risk. People with no skin in the game are dangerous people because they're, they're going to get paid no matter what. They don't <laughs> really care. Right? If you're a bank CEO, you were very well treated the last 10 years. Don't even go to jail. You did a lot of money, million dollars, two million dollars a year. You had a jolly good time because you never actually really risked anything. Right? And there are a lot of people like that. Government, institutions, all our fundamental parts of society. Watch out for, those, for these people because they're dangerous. Because they're actually not risking anything. And I don't mean necessarily financial risk. It can also be just that they're actually risking their careers or the way they do things, right? But a lot of them don't. Also, really train risking, right? Back when I was a te te teenager, I was a hockey DJ. This is a very uh, absurd uh, profession to be in. But it basically means you're DJing with two, three thousand people. You're not a DJ. It's like, it's like being a club DJ. You're building the energy. You're building it up together with the crowd. You're creating momentum, right? And every point in time when there's a break in the game every 90 seconds, you make the call on what it, how do we keep this energy going, right? And if you click the wrong button on your Mac and you play the wrong music, then you can kill the whole thing that you just spent 10 minutes going up to, right? I did this when I was 12 or 13 or 14 years old, right? And it's basically probably shaped everything I've done ever since in terms of uh, how you work and how, how you facilitate and how you respect the people out there and how you don't think that, that the shit is about you, but you're just part of it. But then, hey, you're also a pretty, pretty big part of it now and then. But ultimately, you keep on risking every, every time you click that button on what is the mood we're in here, right? And keep on failing, right? And keep on staying stupid, right? Find that safe environment, because this was hockey DJing, right? It's not like there were that many zeros on the risk and that many, I mean, my profession was not uh, probably not challenged forever or my reputation, because nobody knew who the damn hockey DJ was, by the way, right? <laughs> because the hockey DJ was just, uh, just some guy sitting down in a booth, right? It was not like the hockey DJ went on and said, you know, and it was not like the hockey DJ was like, DJ Thomas in the house, right? <laughs> the hockey DJ was this little gentle person that was sitting, and sometimes you did pr pretty crazy stuff, like having a game with 3,000 people where you were at the epicenter of the whole season, the people are raging, and you're in flow with them, and the whole thing is totally crazy, like, right? It's a pretty crazy club gig to play as a 12-year-old. <laughs> so find your safe environment for, for really playing with risk, right? Where you're actually risking a lot, but actually you're not, right? Find that balance. Then really risk it together, right? Because risking things alone can be very frightening, right? But the interesting thing for us stupid human, human beings is if you're two, three, or four people, then suddenly, nah, there's no risk because we all believe in the same and we're a great team and we're together, right? Ultimately, there's probably more risk because then you also need to be able to collaborate and work together and et cetera, which is a whole ne new level of risk. But if you bond together and find the others, find your collaborators, find your early co-founders, find your co-designers, find your early ambassadors, find your tribe, then suddenly, hey, the risk is not there, right? Hey, there's going to be uh, 50 people of creative morning no matter what. It's going to be a jolly good show no matter what, right? Ah, suddenly there's no risk in it, right? Or, we, hey, we have two people doing it, so ah, there's no risk. We're going to you know, watch out for each other, right? Find the others always. And then, obviously, lastly, really train your risk 
detection, right? Your pattern recognition and understanding. Your sensing. Can you feel? You really take it all in. Because then you can start understanding, is this risky or not, actually? But if you look and abstract it out to sort of an externalized perspective, then everything in life can be very risky and, and very abstract. If you try to run the math on what risk is, you need to build up the intu intuition in your stomach on, you know, what is this stuff we're actually, right? You need to feel, what is the energy of the team today? Oh, what's going on? Oh, oh that person is having some issues. Oh, we need to be over there a little. There's some risk there. Oh, okay. Uh, do we actually have our shit together? Is that, that, is that this product design we're working on really, actually really good? You need to feel it, right? And then when you have it, whoa, then it's amazing, right? But you need to build up that in yourself to be able to feel the risk because you can't put risk into a formula. Uh, the financial crisis very, uh, very well proved that. The math can sh can't show what risk actually is about, right? And every time you try to take risk down to such a banal level, then things start going very crazy. Then also get really good at, at shutting it out, right? Because if you take it all in, then, uh, then it gets a little sensitive at times. So um, I'll end on my pledge to you, uh, which is to endorse risk, live with it, don't ignore it, accept it, work it, push it, look it directly in the eyes, love it and hate it, right? Take max risk if you've got nothing to lose. Because if, you if you're not taking risk there, you know, how are you ever going to take risk in your life if you're not really pushing at that point in time, right? Keep on risking every day, every month, every year. Keep pouring yourself into it, right? I sent my kids off to school this morning on the bus alone to be here, right? <laughs> that was the biggest risk I took today, right? <laughs> Apart from giving a talk I'd never given before, right? Which was also partly scary. Risk everywhere, right? Risk professionally. Risk in your craft, in your design. Risk in your relationships. Write that person, ah, let's do a coffee. It was a little bit risky, but then, ah, wow, it became your best friend or somebody you were going to do great things with, right? Risk it in love, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And obviously, work out how not to risk it all at the same time, right? Because then things are really in movement in all parts of your life, you're risking it everywhere at the same time, right? Then you, you also start becoming good at spotting people like that. Okay, that person is really moving just now. We better not really work with this person, let him or her settle down a little bit because everything is just a move. <coughs> Who they are, everything, right? At the same time. Risk what you say, risk crossing the step of that border over the, the fear you seemingly perceive as being there and ultimately keep on risking on who you are. Thank you. <laughs>